Welcome back, everyone, from the DPL. I am back for week three re week three recaps for the Mad Men. And, uh, yeah, why don't we just hop right into the games? And uh, let's see if the Mad Men can pull off a another W. All right, we're here for game number one, Bacon versus uh, Zugaboo. So why don't we just hop right into the game? Zugaboo's Terra Captain's... Terra, Terra Captain is actually Terra Fairy Tornadus T, and Bacon's is Terra Steel Rotom Wash and Terra Fairy Thunder T. So Bacon kind of starts the game with a suicide lead Meow Scarada, um, with kind of Mismagius in the back to dissuade or block the spin if it ever arises from the Kupuavel. But uh, he ends up trading that, and I I thought he would potentially go for Rocks here with Tinkaton, but instead he goes for Encore and locks it into um, Gigaton Hammer. Now, normally the pass mechanic meant that you were able to use it again, um, depending on when the Encore was used. That's like a fast Encore versus a slow Encore. But um, he forces that, forces it out regardless. And then uh, Run and Wash ends up getting a nasty plot here and ends up critting the Tinglu. So I'm pretty sure that probably mattered. Um, I don't know what the Tinglu ended up going for, whether it be like a Ruination or a potentially getting its own hazards up. But regardless, not getting chip on Rotom could be pretty, uh, pretty dire here for Zugu. But as the Mad Men supporter, we take those. And, uh, but yeah, eventually it's just kind of just a bunch of exchanging of uh, chip damage here. And then Rotom Wash eventually comes back in uh, and ends up Terra stealing here with Terra Blast and Oko's the Baxcalibur, which is pretty big. And then uh, Rotom Wash living the Mystical Fire and getting its third kill of the game. Uh, potentially no more left in its tank as uh, this Thunderous ends up revealing that it is faster than the Tornadus as it goes for a Terra Fairy here and he brings back in the Thunders which basically proves that it's Scarf Thunder T. Goes for a Thunderbolt, two shots at Tinkaton regardless and all that's left is this Thunderous and the Quabble and he ends up sacking it to get the chip on the Torn and he's able to go into a Booster Speed Great Tusk which should just win this game here um, as uh, he should outspeed a Quabble even with an Aqua Step as he goes for a close combat here as uh, the Quabble does go for the Aqua Step, doesn't knock it out, and this should be lights out for Great Tusk, but the Quabble outspeeds, and this looks like the game is over as this may just comes in, but does it click Endure as it goes for Aqua Step, and uh, yeah, another Custep Berry win for the Mad Men. Incredible. I, I don't know how the Great Tusk didn't outspeed. It was probably max speed booster, but yet somehow it got outsped by the Kukwabble. It was probably Scarf Kukwabble, I had imagined then, if that was the case. Um, and ultimately, the Custap does end up saving the Mammon here as they move up 1-0 in the series after game number one. So why don't we head right into game number two. All right, we have game number two, Nick versus Lachon. Here we have the fraudulent Alakazamless draft that Nick will be using. Uh, but this game basically starts with Eldegoss giving an assist into a substitute, Blacephalon, that does uh, end up going for Fire Spin and trapping this Weezing instead of killing it with that Destiny Bond play as he goes for Taunt on the Blacephalon who can no longer click Substitute. But he does go for Shadow Ball and does get a knockout, but an attack boost from the Beast Boost. Um, but he ends up going for Shadow Ball and getting massive damage on the Seisma Toad. And uh, just off of lead, this... Uh, Bocephalon is doing a lot of work and eventually the taunt does end so he, he does opt to go for a scout here and go for substitute um, not trying to attack the Snorlax and then as you can see here he does go for the fire spin to ensure that the Snorlax does stay in but whether or not it will click something like protect right here um, is yet to be seen but he does not click protect as Nick goes for the explosion and knocks out the Snorlax and that basically opens up the a path for this Slowbro that goes for a Trick Room and activates the Weakness Policy. Um, but yeah, at this point, he has to stall the Trick Room and he's just pivoting around Scizor and Seismitoad. And this Slowbro is going to put in some work, but he does reveal a sub Fundy Eye, which does stop this in its tracks. So he ends up swapping into his Landorus here. And, uh, but yeah, basically the, the Fundy Eye kind of stops that sweep in its tracks but at this point the slowbro doesn't really need any uh, boosting um to kind of solo this team if it were to get trick room up later and the only countermeasure would be that sub funding t but basically he ends up trading melmetal for garchomp 
as uh, he ends up getting his Azelf in here, as he goes hard Scizor, as he Ice Punches, thinking he's free to just click a fire move after. It does reveal uh, a Scarf Scizor here, and uh, he ends up going into his Landorus, which reveals to be Scarf, but the Scarf Scizor is faster and removes the Scarf on Landorus. So now the Thundy, T Thundy Eye has an out to go for Substitute and pray that the Landorus does miss here as it gets a Salic Berry boost, um, but it won't be able to substitute anymore. And so it's banking off a miss, but Nick smartly clicks Explosion here, knowing he can't sub anymore and doesn't even risk the miss. Double Explosion ends up winning the game and the Mad Men are now up 2-0 after uh, two pretty good wins to start the series. Uh, so yeah, why don't we move right into the third game after that explosive start. All right, so we're gonna put this on to uh, hyper speed. So we have game three, Lucas versus Gorex. Gorex brings Terra Electric Sneasler and Lucas brings Terra Ghost, Latios, and Donphan. Uh, this game takes a long time, so I have sped it up into hyper fast, but essentially the early game is just working around this bulky leftovers Terra Shell Terrapagos with Toxic as Lucas attempts to break the Terra Shell with Flip Turn Alomomola and U-Turn Zapdos. Um, Scizor, uh, and I'm not bad, not Scizor yet, but um, yeah, basically, Latios is able to do a bunch of chip damage at some point and uh, kind of force some uh, pretty big uh, trades, um, as we'll see. Um, but this uh, Chox ends up having some like weird, eerie impulse set. Don't really understand, but yeah, Metagross is able to take the hit because it is a minus one Latios now, and it is pretty bulky with sub leftovers. Um, but yeah, eventually he gets... Uh, yeah, just doing a bunch of trades here. Um, not a whole lot. The Sableye comes in. He expects maybe an Encore to come out, but he doesn't click Encore as it is Balloon for probably to rem get rid of like any uh, Rapid Spin shenanigans there. But Latios comes in, and uh, because of that missed burn on the uh, on the Latios, <laughs> Sneasler actually ends up having an out by clicking Dire Claw and putting it to sleep. Which kind of benefits Gorex, is kind of forces it out and takes out one of the the bigger uh, threats here in the game. Uh, but the Sneasler does end up getting sacked to the Weavile for, for some reason. I don't know why, but there's basically no power left between Terrapagos, Metagross, and Shox. Um, as a result, Latios is able to kind of slowly sub up, whittle down the, the Metagross, as well as kind of try and 1v1 the Sandy Shox, it can Eerie Impulse all at once, but Power Gem doesn't break the sub as he's able to just Shadow Ball and uh, basically knock out the shocks. And at this point, the Terrapagos isn't going to be doing a whole lot as he's going to just try and break the Terra Shell as he knocks out the Latios. And then Zapdos comes in and is able to Solus Terrapagos with Eerie Impulse, Roost, and Discharge Spam. Um, and because it got burned by the Terrapagos' Flamethrower, which is really fortunate for Lucas, um, he cannot be toxic by this Tropicos, which allows this whole exchange to even occur, and he's able to just completely solo the Tropicos to Oblivion. So now that's three straight games in a row for the Mad Men. They're up 3-0. They need two more games in the next five to win the series and claim two points. They'll need one more to secure the tie. So they need to keep their foot on the gas and just maintain all of the momentum that they have right now uh, with these... Uh, back-to-back -back dominant wins and yeah why don't we just hop right into game four and see if the Mad Men can secure the tie in four straight games all right we're here for game number four ipro versus sky penguin um this game felt like testing did not reveal all the counter leads it felt like it was a little unpolished um versus this hazard stack risking a burn off of lead there uh would have been pretty dire for this crustle but it is a sturdy custap with double hazards as ipro's team has zero hazard removal but um yeah this lead seismitoad ends up being sash and knocks out the crustle and then actually knocks out the uh kartana with max special attack earth power and um yeah then he ends up sacking coco for some reason to nihiligo instead of going into like blastoise or mesprit and that's basically the game the game is over um there's not much <laughs> you can do um if it's like a scarf like, it is a Scarf Nihiligo, so Charizard X is going to be checked regardless at this point. And, um, yeah. He gets in 
his Celesteela, the Charizard comes in. He's able to click a, a Z move and do a, a decent amount of damage to the Charizard as it's able to roost as he ends up going for an Earthquake. And at this point, the Charizard is forced to knock out the Steela and in comes the Nihiligo, which can just lock into Sludge Wave here and do damage to the Mesprit. He doesn't need, need it anymore as the Charizard is uh, this low. Uh, he ends up going for Sludge Wave and it does two-shot the Charizard anyways. And uh, yeah, the game ends pretty uncompetitively. Uh, no bias at all as a, as a Mad Men supporter. This was by far the worst game from the Mad Men this season. Um, just off of entertainment alone. Honestly, it could be the worst DPL game of the season by entertainment alone. This game was really uncompetitive. Nothing really happened. Uh, iPro just had the solid lead that wasn't played around and Nihiligo just cleaned up the game, essentially. That's all That's all that happened. Um, it felt pretty unpolished from Sky's side, uh, kind of just relying on some type of HO hazard stack type of lead. Um, and he himself recognized that the, moving forward, he will need to be better. Um, and that he felt like he was a little bit unpolished with uh, some of these lead scenarios with Krustle. But yeah, game pretty un uh, pretty convincing for iPro. And uh, the Mad Men now dropped their first game of the series, but hopefully in the next four, they're able to pick up two or at least one to at least secure the tie. But let let's move on to game number five. All right, we have game number five. We have Blitz versus Paddocks. Uh, this game starts off with a little bit of a cheeky Galar Slowking, uh, tricking its Black Sludge onto Blitz's regular Slowking and stealing the Heavy Duty Boots. And as we'll see, those Heavy Duty Boots end up playing a big part in the end game later. Um, and it's sort of kind of a slow burn early to get rocks up for Blitz. And then he kind of scouts off um, some of uh, Paddox's sets, like what damage that they're doing, and including what looks to be a pretty spadef or fat DD Kyurem, or this is a really weak Volcarona. Um, regardless, the Kyurem is able to DD and get up a Roost, and uh, is able to secure some chip on the Piloswine as it does go for the Roar. Um, but again, continuing that like slow burn of just pivoting around things uh, the best that uh, he can, he gets in his Zeraora finally, as he ends up going for a knockoff. It does reveal to be Choice Bandit here, which should do a massive amount of damage to this team if he's able to uh, re retain the chip on Leafeon and also chip down the Lander Psy um, and see potentially what this Rotom Wash and Cinderace is. I mean, it could spell bad news if he allows those things to all get chipped down um, over time. And this Rotom Wash is pretty annoying for Blitz. It's kind of this pivot set um, with Hydro Pump, Volt Switch, and Will-O-Wisp. Um, which he's able to just continue to spread around the status. And with the burn and the tricked Black Sludge, this Spadef Slowking is really not able to uh, pivot around this Rotom that well. But in comes a Celesteela, as the Rotom does go for a uh, a Hydro Pump here, as Celesteela is trying to basically trade with this Rotom Wash by Giga Draining. And he's able to do a ton of damage, so kind of revealing that this is not a uh, Spadef Rotom Wash. Uh, but yeah, he ends up deciding to save the Rotom Wash here and going into his Kyurem. And uh, yeah, it just makes another double in the Slow King, kind of slowly getting burn damage off on the Celesteela. And once again, the Slow King, as much as it can come in with Spadef, it's taking massive amounts of damage, 18% each time it comes in due to Black Sludge and burn. Um, but Slowking decides to stay in as Zara decides not to go for the knockoff, but instead goes for the Blaze Kick. Uh, fortunately, does not get burned. I mean, not, does not get uh, poisoned by the Sludge Bomb. And uh, Paddox ends up having to uh, get a lot of chip on his Kyurem and the Cinderace revealing that he is um, not Boots. As the Cinderace goes for a pretty cool Endure Salic Berry here, on the Nihiligo, scouting potentially it being Scarf or going for Meteor Beam, um, and he's able to click Reversal and one-shot the Celesteela. Um, Piloswine is basically forced to come in and Ice Shard, the Leafeon chews it, and this gives it its opportunity to heal up, which helps versus that Zeraora um, potentially later on. Now the Landorus does come in, 
He had it could potentially be Choice Scarfed as a way to check the Volcarona as well as the Zara Aura. And uh, this pile of swine, with it being burned, is not going to be able to do any damage versus basically Paddox's team. So he's Blitz is basically just going to spam Roar until he's been knocked out. Pile of swine does end up dying. And this gives Zara Aura the opportunity to come in. But Kiram opts to just stay in versus Zara Aura, which could have clicked potentially a close combat. Paddox making that read instead of um, anything else. But Kiram goes for a DD as the Volcarona does go for a Quiver Dance. And he goes for Overheat, getting massive damage, but not knocking out the Kiram. But somehow the Nihiligo does live the Dragon Claw because the Kiram is probably not invested. It's very look Spadef looking. But Nihiligo does get crucial chip damage on this Landorus. And as you'll see, it basically comes down to Blaze Kick. The Rotom Wash is in range. The Leafeon can take damage. And as you can see, he's able to go for a Blaze Kick here. And had the Slow King not tricked the Heavy Duty Boots onto itself, he would not have been able to swap out here and uh, basically play around um, all of the hazards. Or he would have basically had to sack more things, giving it uh, the... Basically, the Zara more opportunities to potentially win this game, but he does get a poison with the Sludge Bomb, and that basically seals up the game. Um, pretty good game overall. Um, I felt like Blitz made some pretty hard reads with his Zara, which ended up forcing him to take a Sludge Bomb earlier in the game, and he doubled out on the Kiram, which ended up staying in and attacking his Volcarona. So there's a there's some things to to learn from there, but pretty good close game. Um, but the series is now 3-2, and the Mad Men are still trying to look for that, that tying uh, series tie game, the, the fourth game of the series. So let's move into game six and see if they're able to accomplish that after dropping two straight. All right, we have game six, Rai versus Jake. The game starts with a Lee Jirachi with sort of this, uh, this coverage as Rai kind of wants to scout it out, and he goes into a Swampert. Which is able to dodge the play rough. And um, then he scouts any potential grass move here by going torn. As uh, he goes for a heat wave versus the Jirachi going for rocks. And that's a pretty good trade for Rai as he's able to kind of play around all of this. He goes into a Swamper. And uh, kind of shockingly, I thought I was surprised he went into Swamper as it could get Air Slash flinched to death. But it is, in fact, a fast Swamper who gets up his rocks. But a big crit does come out here. Um, from the Togekiss, but obviously if uh, the Jirachi had landed the play rough, it would have probably died to that air slash regardless. Um, but yeah, as uh, he ends up swapping out his Metacham as he missed the rock slide, which was pretty big if he had like bullet punch in the back as well to pick this off. Not having to risk the speed tie, he ends up swapping into Torn, who ends up missing the heat wave, and he loses Torn basically for nothing um, versus that Jirachi. So pretty big... Um, momentum swing against right here as um he's basically forced to get up his uh his spikes and stuff and uh he toxics the dawn fan gets a burn with fire fang and uh yeah klefki's not really able to to do a whole lot here um but he gets his azumarill in as again he goes for another spin to remove the hazards and uh azumarill ends up knocking out the dawn fan karen black's gonna come in right has to play aggressively here and bring in his hydreigon but yeah, with the with the torn being gone, there isn't a whole lot he can do versus things like Keldeo and Karen Black revenging wise. But he basically brings in his Metacham to get chip, and for some reason decides to sack his Metacham. I don't really understand the play a whole lot. I thought he would sack the Klefki here um, to basically get in his Hydreigon or his um, his Azumarill, but he ends up just. Basically sacking his whole team to the Keldeo. Um, even with Scarf Hydra, he didn't have a way to kill the, the Keldeo, it looked like. Um, but even then, that chip would have potentially been useful. And the Metacham could have tried and soloed um, the Kiram Black, Togekiss, and Mega Manetra core at the end. Obviously, with Intimidate, he would have been able to um, cycle that and sack off Togekiss, come in and bolt again. Um, and I think Manetric ultimately would have won the game from that point. Um, had he had Swamper, it would have been a bit interesting, but again, I think the play rough miss into the crit kind of sort of balanced out for, uh, for Jake there. And, uh, yeah, Rai just basically conceded the game. I assume he was a bit tilted, but 
Regardless, the series, after such a strong 3-0, is now tied at three apiece. And the Mad Men are kind of scrambling at this point. They're, they've lost three straight, and they basically need to win the last two to secure the two points. But they need to first worry about just getting one more to at least secure the tie and a point. Um, because not getting a point after starting 3-0 would be absolutely tragic for them. So yeah, why don't we head right into game number seven? All right, game seven. Her we have Joshua versus Harris. Harris has a Terra Fire Seralage, and Joshua has a Terra Water Torn T. Uh, this game is a uh, pretty straightforward. Um, Torn is just here to break things, and as you can see right now, it is Choice Specs Terra Water, and it absolutely obliterates the Zapdos. And he opts to save it, and he, he really knows he has no switch in, so he ends up sacking the Diancie here, um, as there was really no safe switch in around the Torn. He had to basically give up one at that point in time. He ends up sacking the Garchomp to get up rocks, as the G-King most likely with Sugar Berry goes for Ice Beam, and the Garchomp, not Yachi Berry, ends up dying. Um, the Serra Ledge does come in, does click Terra, uh, opts to not KO the Quillfish for some reason, Probably a bulkier uh, Serra Ledge spread and probably expected maybe the Quillfish to be max speed and uh, it not being able to do, um, it probably would have been able to just get off like a Toxic or a, or a Crunch or a Pain Split of some kind. Um, but yeah, Joshua then kind of opts to take the foot off the gas a little bit and just kind of starts throwing things out to uh, get hazards up. He's able to uh, to spin with Treads to remove the, the rocks, which is nice. But he opts to go for Backscalibur here for some reason instead of Torn. Um, this was a, I believe, was a complete fumble. I don't know what he was thinking doing that. He basically lost all of his progress and all of his momentum that he had just set up with the spike and the rocks and the spinning. He should have went Torn and just clicked Terra Blast. I don't know what he was thinking the Zapdos was going to do. I don't know why he went Backs instead. Um, but as you see... Eventually, he's gonna able he's gonna be able to get torn in again. He's gonna start killing things. He's EV to live a freeze dry from full because it's not specs bundle, and uh, yeah, he's basically gonna scout. He basically stayed in, forced another kill on the Scizor. He goes slow king is able to click psychic to weaken this bundle, and at this point, he's he knows that he's probably gonna swap into his Seraledge as he goes for a chili, brings in thunders again. I mean, not thunders, tornadus again and is able to click Terra Blast once more. And uh, this game is essentially over. He sacks the Rotom to the bundle, and he's gonna be able to clean this game up with the Galar Slowking. Um, yeah, this game was much needed, a much needed rebound uh, game. And it was very convincing um, and pretty dominant with the Torn set from Joshua. I still think the mid game is kind of indicative of kind of how the series has gone. A, such a strong start into kind of a fumble mid-series, mid-game. And then hopefully the ending is kind of indicative of how the series can end going into game number eight. Um, but yeah, they kind of need to reset and lock back in. Um, and hopefully the team is able to do that going into game eight. All right, we're here with game eight, Habita versus Vinny. With a win here, they win the series and secure two points. They've already secured the tie. With a loss here, they will tie with Made in Heaven. And that'll be a big blow in the playoff push here. But yeah, game eight, Hobbita versus Vinny. Vinny has Terra Fairy King Gambit, and Hobbita has Terra Fairy Raging Bolt and Terra Normal Braviary. Vinny leads with this kind of mixed Dragonite that ends up taking out the Duraludon, likely blocking rocks from Hobbita's side um, for the rest of the game. And then Vinny kind of pivots around and gets a booster speed Iron Defense Sandy Shocks in that ends up trading damage versus uh, AV, Thor AV Torn. And uh, he's basically able to get around it and take out the shocks in the process. Um, but kind of at this point in the game, every time Greninja comes in, it's kind of just claiming a kill. Um, Torn is able to kind of just remove the Mesprit, but again, this Greninja comes in, it's able to get a kill with Life Orb, Protean. Uh, he's trying his best to pivot around, but ultimately he calls a double here, gets his Greninja in on the Torn using the Weezing. Habita is basically conditioned to go Torn every time on the Weezing, and he's able to claim 
another Mon, which ends up being the Torn with Ice Beam. And this whole random exchange of Ceaseless Defog with Weezing, uh, with the Samurott dying to burn. Treads is able to go for a spin here, but it's not enough as the King Gambit is really fat and is able to click low kick and uh, ends up sh revealing that he's Assault Vest and very bulky and King Gambit is able to solo this endgame and it's a really, honestly, a really convincing win for Vinny here. Um, there wasn't really a whole lot that Haba could do in this game. Um, it was pretty easy. Gren came in whenever King Gambit was saved for the end game um, very well, and it had essentially the, the tools it needed to basically solo that end game. And uh, Shocks really, I mean, Shocks didn't really do a whole lot outside of weak and torn down a little bit um, and force out treads. But uh, the big thing was the D Knight preventing rocks from getting up, which was pretty, pretty big. But obviously, the Weezing might have been able to defog anyways. Um, but yeah, this Weezing kind of put in overtime as well. But yeah, sadly, the Mad Men tie. Uh, they aren't able to get that fifth win despite starting 3-0. and um, And, you know, I mean, they're, 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 they got to learn. Letting games slip away will find a way to bite you in the ass. And they they can tell you that, that themselves, that they played pretty, pretty bad in the middle of this series, I will say. Um, they're they're, they're going to be fine with me to also telling them that, like, I, I think they played pretty poor. Um, and... Because with how the series had started and with how they had been prepping so far, it looked like they were going to be able to, you know, take control of the series, not take their foot off the gas. It looked like they got a little bit com too comfortable. Um, so, yeah, the Mad Men know they fumbled hard this week, but it does not mean they didn't learn something valuable about, you know, the potential weaknesses as a team, um, whether it comes to like, um, you know, team support prep, mocking, um, communication, um, knowing when to take the foot off the gas, which is never. Um, so it's a good thing for them to, to figure out. But they know they can be a greater version of themselves. So come post mids, I know they will perform better um, as a team and they will have to in order to make that strong playoff push after now they're, I think they're only at three, three points after three weeks. Not ideal, but not the worst. Uh, they can still win out and make the playoffs, um, but they're going to have to win out and uh, they're going to have to do it against some very strong teams moving forward. But yeah, thank you everyone for watching. Let's hope the Mad Men can regain post mids, regain their composure and all that. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys for any mids updates or we'll just hop right into the game for recaps. Peace.